Since the publication of his study, Colin Wilson, The Man and His Mind, in 1990, Howard Dosser has continued to reflect on the profound contribution Wilson has made to the ongoing analysis of the human condition. Following Wilson's death in 2013, Dosser has turned again to the first volume in the Outsider Cycle. In revisiting it, he has come to a deeper appreciation of its significance as the foundational document for the entire body of Wilson's broad field of publications. In addition, Dosser has perceived what he considers to be the urgent contemporary relevance of the work and why it has never been out of print since its original publication. In this presentation, Dosser explains why he has come to these judgments. Here is Howard Dosser. Good evening. In 1947, when he was just 16 years of age, Colin Wilson raised towards his mouth a file of deadly acid with the intention of swallowing its contents and ending his life. It was a pivotal moment, not only in his personal history, but also because it holds a vital clue to the theme of his first book, which he subsequently published through the house of Victor Galenx. His action was the reaction of a juvenile in a state of angst. But in this case, it was more than a state of emotional distress. It bore all the hallmarks of a precocious, sharply honed, and deeply engaged intellect. As the file approached his lips, the young Wilson was flooded with an overwhelming insight. Should he drink its contents, he realised, he would be destroying not only the mind that was strained at the human condition in which it struggled to find meaning, but it would also closed down the mind that he understood to have the intrinsic capacity to resolve his dilemma. These two aspects of the incipient writer, the destructive and the creative, faced each other momentarily, and it was in that confrontation that the seed of the volume we now know as The Outsider was possibly germinated. The would-be suicide in Wilson had perceived a world in which there was something profoundly disturbing. Things were not as they should be. Nor had he been alone in this aborted intention to self-destruct. Throughout the ages, writers and other men of great sensitivity had actually perpetrated the act against themselves and, in so doing, had testified to the very sturm and drang Wilson was soon to bring into sharp focus. By and large, then, The Outsider was probably initially conceived of as a diagnostic work. It is a tour de force of existential analysis and its relevance to an assessment of the human condition in the first part of the 21st century is unmistakable. For in it, Wilson articulates his thesis that recent history provides a view of man that reveals him as being enclosed in a negative self-image, distraught at the personal and social conditions in which he is forced to struggle and devoid of a volition strong enough to support him in that struggle. And yet, in the volume's opening pages, Wilson insists that the outsider's problems lie in the fact that he sees too deeply and too much like Barbusa's character in L'Enfer, with his eyes glued to a hole in the wall through which he witnesses 
birth, death, and everything that happens in between in the hotel room next to his own. This profound Wilsonian insight is considerably more than a simple element of his diagnosis. It is a reminder to the reader that the writer is the creative Wilson who lowered the file of acid from his mouth. It is a clear indication that Wilson had already recognised the solution to the problem he was addressing. Both the problem and its resolution were to be found in the domain of human consciousness. But Wilson was determined to be thorough in his diagnosis and in the event it became the raison d'etre for the first volume of his outsider cycle. The explication of his solution was to be delayed until the publication of succeeding volumes. Thus, in delineating the issue to be resolved, he proceeded to draw on his extensive reading and utilised the writings of Barbusa, Wells, Dostoevsky, Sartre, Camus, Hess, Gurdjieff, T. E. Lawrence and others to demonstrate his thesis. Wilson's treatment of these writers is a penetrating treatment of their engagement with a common theme, the problematic dimension of the human condition. Critics such as Hilde Graf judged him harshly for traversing their works in a display of literary shallowness. But her Catholic theological background blinded her both to his central argument and to the efficiency of the manner in which he used his sources to underpin that argument. Salient points he makes in analysing these writers requires some notice, however brief. Wilson's treatment of these writers is a penetrating indication of their treatment of a common theme as we have noted. He notes, for instance, Hesse's portrait of the emerging Russian man, a man who rebels against existing restrictions because they contain him and deny him his flight of fancy. He wishes to transcend the moment, reach across the boundaries of morality and enter into the life he believes to be available beyond the veil. This is not an idle dream, but a drastic necessity, for he simply cannot live within the existing framework. Hesse's Demian understands that the life of every man is a road to himself, but that no man has ever yet attained to self-realisation. In Hesse's Steppenwolf, the pivotal character, Harry Heller, comes across a document entitled A Treatise on the Steppenwolf, in which he finds the following text. Man is not yet a finished creation, but rather a challenge to the spirit, a distinct possibility dreaded as much as desired. Hess goes on to argue that the way towards this desired state has only been covered for a very short distance and with terrible agonies and ecstasies. This evolutionary aspect of his existence further disturbs the equilibrium of the outsider, for he longs for stability and certitude. In the dual nature of Harry Heller, man and wolf, goat and tiger, Wilson recognises the fragmented nature of contemporary man. On the one hand, in the man, we have the bourgeois 
who spends his time bleating out a mediocrity, while the wolf, perhaps made most visible in Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov, murders an elderly pawnbroker, partly out of a felt need to assert himself. A savage who is determined to upgrade his goat status. Heller, Wilson writes, is bound to spend his days divided by their squabbling. H.G. Wells extends the outsider's concerns into a veritable cosmic area when he writes, The writer finds very considerable reason for believing that within a period to be estimated by weeks and months rather than years, there has been a fundamental change in the conditions under which life, and not simply human life, but all self-conscious existence, has been going on since its beginning. If his thinking has been sound, the end of everything we call life is close at hand and cannot be evaded. He is telling you of the conclusion to which reality has driven his own mind and he thinks you might be interested enough to consider them. T. E. Lawrence, looking at we Westerners of this complex age, saw monks in our body's cells, thus suggesting a company of intellectuals tied to an outdated and outmoded worldview that prevents us from extending ourselves in the direction of which, what we wish to become. Like Sartre's fictional Requitin and Barbusa's outsider, Lawrence could not experience any reality within the world, with the result that he felt that he, together with humanity as a whole, had come to serve non-doing rather than doing. He felt the mystic inertia pervades everything. In Eric Kennington's study of Lawrence, Wilson notes the following comment from a school teacher to whom Lawrence had shown a copy of his major work, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Reading this book has made me suffer, the school teacher protested before going on to explain. The writer is infinitely the greatest man I know, but he is terribly wrong. He is not himself. He has found an I, but it is not a true I. So I tremble to think of what might happen next. He is never alive to what he does. There is no exchange. He is only a pipe through which life flows. But to live truly, one must be more than that. This comment, argues Wilson, not only permeates or penetrates to the root of Lawrence, it is an accurate description of the outsider. Friedrich Nietzsche experienced a deep need to know himself, the implication being that he felt he was estranged from his essential being. He filled his diary with melancholy and longed for the reshaping of the whole kernel of man. Wilson recognised in him the quintessential outsider, a man alienated from his own identity. In Wilson's terminology, he was imprisoned in a thought-riddled nature. Significantly, however, it was within Nietzsche's insights that Wilson found a key element in his search for an answer to the outsider's concerns. Upon the hill Leach, Nietzsche underwent an epiphanic moment in which he experienced a sense of eagerness and well-being. He recognised in a flash that pure will, unencumbered by intellect, could produce 
happiness and freedom. There is a key element in Nietzsche's Eki Homo that caught Wilson's attention. Nietzsche wrote, To overthrow idols, idols is the name I give to all ideals, is my business. In proportion as an ideal has been falsely worshipped, reality has been robbed of its value, its meaning and its truthfulness. Hitherto, the lie of the ideal has been the curse of reality. It means, or by means of it, the very source of mankind's instinct has become mendacious and false so that the very values have come to be worshipped that are the exact opposite of the ones that would assure man's prosperity, his future, and his great right to a future. Responding to this passage, Wilson comments, This is the essence of Nietzschean existentialism. From it, Existentialism is seen to be the gospel of the will. It does not deny the ideal, provided the ideal comes second and the will first. But if their roles get reversed, if the will to more abundant life is made the slave of the ideal, or if it becomes non-existent, as in most professors, and professional philosophies, then Nietzsche will have no more of it. He calls for it to be scrapped and thrown into the dustbin after all the other ideals that have served their purpose. But Wilson has not yet finished with his description of the problems he had identified. Lev Tolstoy, as Wilson reminds us, also knew the pangs of the outsider Five years ago, something very strange happened to me, Tolstoy had written. At first, I experienced moments of perplexity and arrest of life, as though I did not know how to live or what to do. Then, these moments of perplexity recurred oftener and oftener. Finally, there came attacks of nausea. What I lived on no longer existed, and I had nothing left to live on. It is not alone upon writers, even major writers, that Wilson calls in support of his thesis. In reading the diary of the dancer Vaslav Nijinsky, he recognised that it too points to a form of ostensibly civilised life that has about it the shape of death. He finds much the same in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. But it is of the essence of Wilson's philosophy that he finds in both Nijinsky and Eliot an element of prophetic denunciation, the attitude of healthy men rebuking their sick neighbour. In summary, Having gone to an extraordinary breadth and depth to assemble his argument, Wilson insists that his analysis has demonstrated that great writers, including those we have noted above, as well as many of the fictional characters they have created, have been intensely concerned with the question of the outsider's problems and the manner of how to prevent the outsider destroying his own life by sinking into a slough of despair. Effective medicine is normally associated with an accurate diagnosis. In seeking to address the outsider's despair, Wilson understood that an acute appreciation of the nature of the disease was required. In consequence, he wrote one of the most profound analyses of human alienation 
ever penned and provided the foundation for the elucidation of a philosophy that offered humanity a pathway forward out of its malaise and into a higher degree of integrity and authenticity. Clearly, the creative Wilson who lowered the acid file was, as we have already noted, intuitively aware of the fundamental elements of the solution. Inevitably, hints of that solution begin to emerge within the pages of The Outsider. But the fact remains that the volume is primarily diagnostic, and it was not until the publication of what is tantamount to being the second part of the work, namely Religion and the Rebel, published a year later, that Wilson began to enunciate what he perceived to be the remedy. The Outsider Cycle, with its concluding volumes, The Origins of the Sexual Impulse and Beyond the Outsider, progressively develop his argument towards a resolution of the problem. Critics and readers of Wilson have long tended to identify him as the quintessential outsider. And indeed, he has admitted that there is much that is autobiographical in the pages of his first work. But if ever he was an outsider, it was in his literary imagination only, because he always stood in the position of a man who saw not only deeply and widely, but also meaningfully. Indeed, he may accurately be defined as the quintessential insider. If we construct two circles, one inside the other, and name the larger circle healthy humanity, while we name the inner circle outsiders, it would scarcely be accurate to place Wilson, the writer, within the smaller circle. Certainly, he knows the content of that circle, and he knows it well. The outsider being an almost definitive description of its content. But Wilson is viewing the outsider circle from within the larger circle of humanity. He grasps what it is that defines the healthy person. He understands the problems that create the outsider. And he can identify a doorway in the inner circle that gives its inhabitants free access to the larger circle. Derek Marsh, erstwhile professor of English literature at La Trobe University in Melbourne, once recalled how, on the publication of The Outsider, he noted people of a variety of ideological and intellectual persuasions, young and old, well and maladjusted, hastening to identify themselves as outsiders. Marsh saw this phenomenon as an aberration, with broken people calling for recognition through an inauthentic identification with a young writer who had won the temporary applauds of the critics. But perhaps there was more to it than this. In his opening sentence to The Outsider, Wilson recognises that at first sight, The Outsider is a social problem. Two pages into the book, he explains that the outsider's case against society is very clear. All men and women have these dangerous, unnameable impulses. Yet, they keep up a pretense to themselves, to others. Their respectability, their philosophy, their religion are all attempts to gloss over, to make look civilised and rational, something that is savage, unorganised, irrational. Contemporary civilization is badly fractured, 
and individuals within it are undergoing deprivation and hardship closely aligned to the worst our species has ever had to endure. Social systems themselves are collapsing and there is a desperate and rapidly intensifying need for a new world order. Such conditions constitute a radical challenge to the equilibrium of the individual and lives collapse under them. The outsider is manifestly present among us and the plight in which he flounders must be addressed. One is conscious that Wilson's preferred title for the outsider was the pain threshold and it is clear that he comprehended the anguish of modern man and anticipated the discontent of 21st century societies. A single example illustrates Wilson's argument. One of the scourges of the present age is the prevalence of drug abuse. Significantly, Wilson quotes William James to highlight what may well be the crux of this problem. James writes, The power of alcohol over mankind is unquestionably due to its power to stimulate the mystical faculties of human nature, usually crushed to earth by the cold facts and dry conditions of the sober hour. Wilson comments. Mystical faculties here refers to that flood tide of inner warmth and the vital energy that human beings regard as the most desirable state in which to live. It is a state from which the outsider is exiled by virtue of the insensitive inhuman world in which he strives to exist. It is in this context that Wilson can say of the outsider that his greatest desire, his most burning ambition, is that he should cease to be an outsider. And yet, the paradoxical truth about the outsider is that he is representative of the fact that we are not hollow men. Within him and within all of us, there is an instinctive understanding that life is for the living and that the function of life is to generate more life. The conception that life is a tragedy is but a challenge to us to re-engage with life and enter into its vitality. Wilson draws on George Bernard Shaw's Lilith from Back to Methuselah to emphasise the point. Let us, Shaw's character says, dread above all things stagnation. This stirring challenge may well be regarded as the outsider's credo. In 1958, the Souvenir Press in London published the English version of Feldman and Gartenberg's Protest, an anthology of selected pieces from the so-called Angry Young Men and the Beat Generation of the United States. It brought together Passages from contemporary writers such as Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg and Chandler Brossard, together with examples of the writings of John Wayne, John Osborne and J.P. Donlevy. It included the chapter The Country of the Blind from Wilson's The Outsider. And in so doing, note the anthology's strident title, effectively gave recognition to the cri de coeur, the call to arms and the pleading for human authenticity that Wilson expressed in his volume. The outsider reminds us that there is more to us and to life than we presently appear to comprehend. In a postscript 
to a 1990 Glanks edition of this work, Wilson provided something of the background against which he wrote the volume. Hoisting his banner to the mast, he declared, I could not accept either the death wish of the Romantics nor the historical defeat of the existentialists. For various temperamental reasons, partly because I am an Englishman, I do not share the tendency of gloom and defeat that pervades modern literature. I felt that I had no intention of being either defeated or destroyed. On the other hand, neither have I any sympathy for that lazy and intellectual timid school of English philosophers led by Professor Eyre, who assert that the whole problem is meaningless and that we had better accept our pathetic little limitations. The problem ought to be solvable in its own terms, not by turning away and pretending it does not exist. It seems to me that a solution must be found. It is the extraordinary and invaluable contribution of Colin Wilson that he has defined a significant dimension of the nature of our problem and held it before us in a manner that makes it impossible to ignore. We have succumbed to a state of robotic behaviour because we have declined to engage our will in the restructuring of a drifting, fragmenting world. It is his challenge to us that we must move from the outside to the inner margins of a creative humanity and a state of well-being. In conclusion, we should note that by acknowledging Wilson's acumen in cataloguing the symptoms of our alienation from a fulsome life, it should not be supposed that he leaves us bereft of prescriptions for remedial action. He is no mere analyst, but a profoundly competent commentator on alternative pathways. The outsider provides the foundation for a delineation of some of these pathways. It would be an injustice to Wilson to fail to recognise that through the pages of his later publications, reaching their zenith in superconsciousness, he offers us a cornucopia of luminous prescriptive wisdom. Thank you very much.